Good to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. From when we were talking, I loved your whole attitude to everything that we're about to talk about. And okay. it was, I suppose this area that we're going to talk about is, I suppose, controversial. It's been really nice being here this evening, watching and listening and learning for sure. Um, but the overriding feeling for me about the experience this evening is that all the things that we're talking about are nice and soft and friendly and fun and... The thing about cosmetic plastic surgery is that it can lead to outcomes and results that are all of those things, but without question and without exception in all of the potential things that I can offer, there is a middle bit, which is a journey, um, which is work. Okay. And by work, I could be referring to uh, the consideration of the potential risks and complications of a procedure, it could be the significant expense financially that goes with these sort of interventions. It could be the convincing of friends and family that this is a good thing to do. It could be actually you know, experiencing and dealing with and overcoming a complication. Uh -huh. um, it could be dealing with the anxiety leading up to the procedure, and so on and so on. So the difference, I think, in, in terms of what I do and what I can talk about, as distinct from what we've spoken about heretofore is the, the idea that um, even though these are very, very powerful tools that I have at my disposal and I can, uh, and people like me can deliver really dramatic uh, and very meaningful and long-standing changes and improvements, it's not for nothing. And I think that's a really important concept. Um, cosmetic plastic surgery is a serious business. Um, and one of my responsibilities as someone who, who, who does this for a living is to make sure that my potential patients stroke customers because this is not normal healthcare, this uh -huh. is actually the buying and selling of a service, uh -huh. um, are fully clued in and fully cognizant of the realities. Now, what age would this lady have been? She was um, 30, either 34, 35, 36. She had three big boys. She brought two of them into clinic the first day I met her big bruising lads who obviously had been big babies, big babies and essentially tore her abdominal muscles apart during pregnancy um, and then she hit the gym and got really motivated and lost all the extra weight and was unfortunately left with this which I'm sure some of you are familiar with and this no matter how many miles you run on the treadmill just won't go away and it's tough being a woman and this totally confirms it for me. So she came in and she said, you know, I just want my body back. And I said, well, you know, we can, we can give you your shape back and we can do this operation and deliver a good result, but are you ready for what comes between now and then? And she was totally ready. And she was a very fit, motivated patient. And the wonder and the awesomeness of what I get to do for a living is that when you meet these patients, these potential patients, who are motivated and fit and ready and healthy and up for it both psychologically and physically, you can deliver results like this, which uh, well, I think it speaks for itself. I think that's a great result. That scar is six uh, weeks old. So that's only a six week post-op shot. But I like that photograph because um, I'm all about reality and I'm all about not hiding behind things. I'm all about making sure people understand what the reality here is. So that's uh, an eight, 18 to 20 inch scar. And that's a real thing and that's gonna be there forever. Obviously it won't be that pigmented forever, but that's a real thing. So but the point you, is there's a price for everything. Yeah. But you could see her back being on walking down the beach again, confident. And I see an awful lot of bloggers who are like not even 25 having Botox and having fillers and you, like you, you know they have had work done. But then I see on the other side of people getting older and think, okay, like maybe for, for just not wanting to look so old and we, have, we, were, we were talking about it, where do you sit with, with that whole anti-aging? You know? Yeah, so uh, there's a few ways of looking at this and certainly during my time in New York City, I, I was surprised to have um, women in their late 20s coming in asking for Botox, asking for filler and so on. And my attitude towards this stuff would be pretty liberal. It would be that if someone is open-minded, if they, if they really understand the implications of what they're about to do, if they're well-versed, 
then it's not really my job to question their motivation. As long as they, as they get it, as long as it's moral, ethical, as long as they're not necessarily being forced into it by someone else, for example, as long as it's free will, I think I have to you know, deliver the service that I was trained to deliver. That does touch on another point that I, I'd really like to make. And you can see here, this young lady's lip has been destroyed by the use of filler. So the point of, I would make about this is that people talk about Botox and filler kind of like it's, um, you know, throw away, ice cream. pretty much. Um, and that kind of makes me angry. And I'm among a cohort of properly trained plastic surgeons in this country and beyond who are getting more and more exercised by this. And we're beginning to uh, try and make an impact online and social media and so on in terms of making people aware, making the public, the paying consumer aware that no matter how throwaway or flippant or minimalist these sort of interventions might seem, um, it's really not a good idea to either look for a bargain when you're talking about uh, an intervention, um, nor to uh, not do your homework as to how well trained or not your practitioner is. The truth of it is that anyone in this country with a medical degree can reference themselves as a cosmetic surgeon. Personally, I trained for 20 years, from 1995 until 2015, until I felt confident and comfortable in using that moniker for myself. Um, I know people who went to medical school for five years and who used that term pretty much the day after they got their degree. And it's just wrong and unethical. So the message from me and from people like me in the Irish Association of Plastic Surgeons is that if you are considering cosmetic interventions, be it small, 20 units of Botox, or be it big, a facelift, uh, you really should make sure that your practitioner is properly trained. A properly trained plastic surgeon knows what to do if and when this sort of thing happens. If you're in the hands of whoever, they're not going to know what to do here, and damage like this can you know, be reversed in some cases, but if you're in the wrong hands, it certainly cannot. And that's just probably the overriding message I'd like to impart this evening. Um, just because somebody looks and sounds like a doctor and looks and sounds like they know what they're talking about in terms of a cosmetic intervention, it doesn't actually necessarily mean that they do know what they're talking about. Yeah, and I think, like, uh, I think we all do like bargains, but I think this is the <laughs> one aspect that you can't bargain hunt for this, that you have to go to the proper professionals, you have to research where you're going. And I think that, you know, I mean, one question I would have, I had with you is that if you start an area, is it a cycle? You know, if, okay, mm. I, I have my tummy done and I hate my tummy because, you know, and, and, and this area started, do I start seeing extra areas? Good, qu good question. Yeah, excellent. Um, it, it's work. Uh, it can be tough. Um, it can be hard going at times in order to get the outcome and the end point that you desire. And some people just aren't built for that psychologically or mentally. And a key thing as somebody who offers the service is to be able to, to spot that person before they even know it themselves. Sometimes, however, they get through. Sometimes you do end up operating on people and, and, and realizing you know, that, you know, that, that, that person probably you know, wasn't cut out for this. Um, in the context that you do a good job on somebody in some sort of cosmetic intervention or surgery, um, and they you know, come back and back and back, you know, the alarm bells will definitely ring. Um, and at that point, the responsibility is on somebody like me to, to not necessarily call it openly and offensively with the patient, but certainly to call it internally and to recognize, you know, okay, uh, this is potentially now going down an avenue that's not desirable. Um, and that's something that a good professional will, you know, make a decision on and be firm on, and I think that's part of the responsibility of what I do, is you know, not allowing that sort of thing to happen. And of course, that person can go and do whatever they do Just elsewhere, yeah. but you know, I can only be responsible for me and my patient, uh, and that's something that I, you know, I feel pretty strongly about. Yeah. I have done, and I did in, in London, I worked in a, in, a, in a massive weight loss service in the, in the NHS, where a lot of patients who had experienced massive weight loss after bariatric surgery, for example, or, or diet and exercise and so on, who wanted body contouring, and all of those patients were seen, and that was a really good practice. 
But in the realms of purely cosmetics, it can be a tricky yeah. situation. And I absolutely appreciate what you're saying, and it makes a lot of sense. And perhaps you know, in the future, someday when I have you know, my you know, perfect setup and my perfect clinic with everything exactly the way I want it, perhaps one of the rooms in that place will be occupied by such a person, and that would make a lot of sense. Before any cosmetic surgery, I always see patients at least twice. Um, and Rarely do people turn up with their significant other on the first consultation. They do from time to time. But in that first consultation, I tell them that if they're proceeding with things and they, if they want to take the next step, that we will definitely be having a second consult. And I always really encourage them to bring somebody along if, if, you know, if they're comfortable to do that. It's interesting, actually. Uh, one, a point I would make is that uh, an observation for me is, uh, and another kind of alarm bell for me is, um, patients or potential patients who bring a significant other on the first consultation, um, I found not infrequently that uh, the motivation for them being there at all um, lies with the other person, with the significant other. And that, for me, is an absolute contraindication to, to surgery. Um, and that's something that I would try and sniff out really, really quickly. I've, I've, I, one of the classic signs is where the significant other talks for the potential patient. And that, to me, is, you know, I, I nearly Morning just bells. stop things straight away in that context. But I definitely encourage people to bring someone along with them, yeah. Aging is a progressive thing. So the issue that we're trying to correct is also a progressive, you know, issue. So the lines do get deeper. Okay, now they get deeper anyway, okay? Um, of course, if you get involved with filler, whatever you know, you're doing, and then suddenly stop, yeah, things are gonna bounce back, and there may be an impression that they're worse than they would have been otherwise. I have said, I don't, I don't buy that. I, that's not my experience, it's not what I've seen. I think, yeah, things will come back, but I think you probably end up around about where you would have been anyway. Um, so definitely people out there who are a bit against this kind of thing say, oh, you know, once you start, you can't stop, and if you stop, it's worse. I, I, I don't agree with that. I, I, that's not my experience. Rhinoplasty is probably the most uh, daunting, complicated, fraught, uh, technically challenging procedure in cosmetic plastic surgery. Um, I. I trained for 20 years before I did my first one on my own. Um, so it's probably the thing that I'm asked about most. Um, and in terms of delivery, it's probably the third most common thing I do on the cosmetic side. So tummy tuck followed by breast stuff. So it could be breast reduction, breast augmentation, breast lift, and then rhinoplasty probably. So you said in Kerry, but in New York, <laughs> in New York it was the same. It was the same three in that order as well. And for Botox and fillers, yeah. how long would you get out of each? So with Botox, it kind of depends on the person. If you're really lucky, you'll get six months. If you're really unlucky, you might only get three. I tell patients four months is a reasonable number. Um, again, it depends who's giving it. Uh, you know, giving Botox seems easy and straightforward, and by and large it is. There are a lot of nuances and tricks uh, of the trade, um, which took me a long time to learn. Um, and with those tricks of the trade, I think I can deliver a result that lasts a bit longer, for okay. sure. Filler, it depends on what you're using. Okay. Um, there are various types, shapes, sizes, forms. Hyaluronic acid has been mentioned here a few times. Yet again, it comes up in the filler spectrum. There are a few other things that are used as filler as well. Calcium hydroxyapatite, for example. So it kind of depends on what you're using. The standard stuff, Juvederm, for example, mm -hmm. made by Allergan, um, depending on which of them you're using, I say somewhere between six and 12 months, probably nine is a reasonable average to give, yeah. Okay, and just, and then I know this is a question that we probably all want price-wise. Yeah, interestingly on my website, the page, when I look at the metrics, the most visited page after the actual homepage is the price list. <laughs> um, and I'm happy about that because I think I'm the only member of the Irish Association of Plastic Surgeons who actually has published a price list online. And I think that sets me apart a little bit. It's probably something that my colleagues are a bit annoyed at me about. But Does this come for consultations? 
Um, On most websites, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, totally, exactly. And I think it's unfair, and I think people have a right to know, you know, what you're getting into. What's the bottom line? What can basically? I afford it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I like to be open about that. Dr. John Kern. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. That was pretty scientific. Yeah, yeah, we're at more science bits.